Hello, my name is Rusty Coons, and I have with me Sasha Haleta of Sasha Cycles of Sturgis. How you doing, Sasha? I'm great, Rusty. How you doing, my man? I'm great, man. It's it's a pleasure to be here with you. Likewise. Thank, it's a pleasure, my man. I've heard a lot of good about you, man, and I want to talk about all of it. So we're going to go from A to Z, but but I want to start off with your childhood when you first were introduced to two wheels. Can you tell me about that? Yeah. Um, I was about four years old. Our uh, neighbor had a, a DT400 Yamaha, and he was riding around. He came... We, I'm from a rural area, uh, gravel roads, a little town up in small town, South Dakota, uh, by the name of Bruce. And he, our neighbor, Greg, was uh, ripping down the driveway one day in his GT400. And I wanted to go for a ride. And mom and dad were like, no, no, you can't do that. We don't want you to. And I, I kind of stammered around because I really wanted to get on this thing. I'd never seen a two-wheeler before. And Greg's like, come on, man. So I got up in front of Greg and I grabbed the middle of the handlebars. We went about 100 yards we hit uh, like a golf or a golf, uh, a golfer mound and my head hit the tank. <laughs> it knocked my two front teeth out there. That yellow and white Yamaha tank was all red from my, from the blood. And uh, my front teeth as a kid growing up were kind of black until my baby teeth fell out. And then my, my real teeth came in. Uh, I kind of had buck teeth. I got braces and they did a great job because people were calling me Bucky as a kid growing up. But that, my first experience on a bike is I knocked my front teeth out. Right. <laughs> You're not going to forget that one. Never. No, not. Let me ask you this, though. Was it job. an improvement? Was it was it better or worse? How'd, how'd the girls like it? Oh, it was, I think the girls dug it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so that was earlier on. Uh, what age were you then? I was about four years old. Okay. I was uh, even yeah, in kindergarten. Yeah, was, yeah. yeah. Okay. So now, uh, what was your next experience with motorcycles? Oh, um, I had a few mopeds and stuff up until I was eleven. Um, my we had this thing back home where they had a uh, uh, clean out week, and where people would put their trash on the boulevard. And my dad, uh, he had a little construction company. And the guys were out grabbing lunch one day, and there was this 1973 CL350 Honda on the boulevard, blue and white. And my dad saw it sitting out there during cleanup week. And uh, he rolled up, it looked like a good bike. And uh, he got out of the truck, and he walked up to the, to the house and knocked on the door. And the guys are like, Al, what are you doing? He's like, I'm going to see if they got the title for this thing. So he knocked on the door of the house. This nice little old lady comes up. He's like, ma'am, I see you're throwing your motorcycle away. We were going to take it off the boulevard for you. Oh, that'd be fine, young man. And he asked her, he goes, you wouldn't happen to have the title for it, would you? Oh, I sure would. Come on in. Would you like some coffee? That's crazy. So that was my next bike was a 73 Honda CL 350. I had that. Uh, I had it for up until the time I was 18 or 19. I had a great motorcycle collection going when I was 19. We'll get into that. But um, my next bike after that was a 65 Harley Davidson Ironhead Sportster. It was a hardtail. Um, it had the long Springer front end on it. With It wasn't the straight. I like the straight ones now, but it had the twisties, the spiral yeah. front end. And I had that for about a year and a half. The guy I bought it from... Uh, he had a, an acreage uh, down the road, so he had a bunch of buildings, so I was able to store it there because technically my parents didn't know about it. I was kind of keeping it on the down low. Mom and dad didn't want me to have a street bike. Well, how they were old finally were you? Ripping. At, at this point, how old were you? I was 15. You're 15 and you got a, a sports rigid? Yeah, that was my first hardtail <laughs> spring in front end, yeah. Stepping <laughs> up, man. <laughs> yeah, it was it was cool. It was neat, man. It had the it was just the kick on it. You had to kind of cycle it, but it was fun. I loved it. And uh about I had it for about a year and a half. My dad found out, and my buddy who I bought the bike from had stored at his uh acreage. He showed up one day with his van and had all a bunch of PA speakers in it. I actually took guitar lessons from this guy. And he's like, dude, you're looking for this PA system. Like, I found this man. He started unloading all the gear. I'm like, I'm like, Scott, what is up, dude? And he just stops dead in his tracks. He stares me dead cold in the eye and says, your dad found out about the Sportster. 
He said he'd kill me if you got it. So here's your PA system now. <laughs> so I got a PA, my PA out of that deal. I don't know about but, that trade, man, but I get it. I get it, man. I had a problem too. I worked for my dad, lived at home, and I got kicked out for buying another Harley after a wreck when I was 19. So I know what you're talking about, you know? Oh, man. Right on. So, so with the Sportster, um, you were uh, – when did you get rid of that? How old were you then? I was – I was 16, so it would have been like 1996. Okay. And then what was the next experience with motorcycles? Um, I got a KZ650 Kawasaki uh, my senior year. I graduated high school. That was like my first street bike. It had the Vetter fairing. It was blue. I miss that bike to this day. Um, I had other countless dirt bikes in the middle, but that was that KZ650 was my first street bike. And I got my motorcycle license. I, w I had to haul it in in a I had an S10 truck and a board. We had to take it to the uh, South Dakota Department of Motor Vehicles. And I'd unload the bike and I had to take the written test. And then at that time, um, you'd put a helmet on. And they had a headphone deal and they'd tell you to take a left turn here. So I had to make sure all my turn signals and stuff you worked. Didn't. Would you wear their helmet that had their headset in it or was it your helmet with their headset? It was my helmet and their headset because it was it was 1998 when I took my test. So this was, you know, this is pre-internet and all that kind of deal when I was doing my my first motorcycle yeah, test. I've just never heard of the DMV doing that anywhere. That's good good knowledge right there. Absolutely, it's, it's interesting. You know what I mean? It's different, huh? So they're talking to you in the headset. Yeah, they talk to you. They say, uh, um, "Okay, we're gonna go down to Main Street. You're gonna take a left on Main." And then we're going to go two blocks. When you get to the next stoplight, you can take a right. And they, they would talk to you on the headset when you would do your motorcycle test. And they're, they still they're do still that. To the, this. Are they still at the DMV talking to you or are they follow? Oh, no, they the follow car? you. They follow you in a vehicle and they, they gotcha. tell you how to turn. And one they guy, want to see if you're one what's guy that? In the car? one guy in a car following you. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And they right. want to see if you're going to put your turn signal on three seconds before yeah. the stoplight or at the stoplight. You know, it's just little stuff like that. Make sure you're going the speed limit. Make sure you and, know how to brake. Over there, don't you have to put both feet down at, when you stop at the stop sign? Correct. And, and especially mm -hmm. during the rally here in Sturgis, mm -hmm. you will get a ticket if you come up to a stop sign, especially for the people if you're cruising on Main Street. If you put one leg down, they yep. will give you a ticket. Yeah, so I heard it. Yeah. if you come to the rally anywhere in Sturgis or the Black Hills in general, when you come to a stop, please put both feet down and then yeah. proceed. All right. Look, everybody that's watching this, remember that. You don't want that ticket. That's good to know. Right on, man. So so go on. So so what's going on here? You're getting ready to move to Sturgis here pretty quick? Yeah, well, I had my 20s. Um well, what happened when I was 19, I had a nice little motorcycle collection going on. Uh -huh. And my dad had a building on the other side of uh, our property. What happened was my KZ650, a bunch of my dirt bikes, my CL350 Honda, my first bike, there was a fire. So I, I think I had about eight or nine bikes. I was 19 and I lost all of them. How'd that happen? Uh, there was a fire in the building. Okay. We had a fire in the yeah. building. And I think it was... Uh, it was rural. We lived in rural South Dakota outside of town, but the wiring, like we heard, you could hear rats in the rafters when you'd walk in the old yeah. building. So it yeah. was uh, the wiring that the rats chewed through the wiring and sure. it just, it was, yeah, I was 19. I lost my motorcycle collection. I was devastated. Oh man. How many um, when that? I was 25, uh, back in 2005, I bought a 92 fat boy, Harley Davidson fat boy. It's mm -hmm. the black one. Like the, ever seen the movie Terminator two. Yeah. That's the bike. Right um, I still got that bike to this day. Um, I learned how to change uh, motor, my tires on that. I learned how to change the oil. I learned what a bottom breather Harley Davidson motor was as opposed to a top breather. Um, the Evo. I, I love that bike to this day. I, I still got it um, through my twenties and thirties. I, I, I would buy bikes on Craigslist fix them up and then I'd sell a few for a profit. I'd list a few on eBay over time. And then I do mainly uh, Japanese bikes and I, I, there'd be a few triumphs and stuff in, in the middle some Norton's and stuff like that. 
I didn't like the Lucas uh, electronic ignitions on uh, the British bikes. They were just dangerous, I thought. I, I could mm -hmm. never figure them out. I hated Amel carburetors on the British bikes. That's just me. Um, but over time, I'd sell more Japanese bikes. I could afford to buy a Harley. You know, back, see, back when I was 18 in 1998, a Sportster was 7500 bucks. There was a waiting list at Harley Davidson for guys to get a bike in the late nineties where they'd wait a year or two, they'd buy the bike and then to be their buddy in the parking lot, they'd sell the same bike. They'd back the trucks up and they'd sell it for a $3,000 profit because there was a waiting list to get bikes. Mm -hmm. And that 7,500 bucks for a Sportster for an 18 year old in 1998, it's a different 7,500 bucks. You could yeah. buy a, a gallon of gas for 80 cents, that kind of thing. Sure. So I didn't wasn't able to get into Harley's till my 20s and my 30s, like heavy. Mm -hmm. um, we moved to Sturgis when I was 39. And we uh, first we bought the house. And then eventually the year later, we uh, were able to get the building that we are in now. And the, the house that you bought uh, originally, what what did you do when you opened up your business when you first got here? Well, that had a, a like a, a 24, it has a 24 by 30 building on it. And we were originally going to do the bike shop out of there. Um, we had put a couple bids on a couple pieces of property, but they fell through or the sellers flaked out or whatever. Um, the first winter we were here, we had a neighbor uh, kind of a few uh, doors down from our shop. Now, and one day I was uh, shoving her driveway out. And she'd ask me, hey, Sasha, how's the cycle shop search going? And I said, not, not worth a scoot, Shirley. She says, give this guy a call. He owns that old gas station behind your house. I said, far out. So I gave the guy a call. I said, hey, I'm your neighbor. Um, I own a, a house right next uh, across the way. And these guys were from Colorado. And so if, if they were like, if they're like, okay, what do you want? Like, did a tree fall down? He's, he's a neighbor. He's a disgruntled neighbor or whatever. I said, actually, here's the deal. I was wondering if you might be interested in selling that building. This was March of 2020. This is when the whole world was shutting down, COVID, yeah. and everything was, people. there was a panic. And th they say there's two types of people. There's people that run into the fire or the ones that run away from it. And I was a volunteer firefighter back home. So I'm used to running into, you know, all right, let's go for this thing. Because a lot of people were selling stuff. They were like, you know what? They, they wanted to li do liquidation and that kind of thing. They're like, oh, yeah, so we're going to buy a building during the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally. That may not happen this year because of this whole COVID thing. The world's in a scare. And we were like, let's just go for it. And we went in. Uh, the bank was like, yep, you, you got your 20% down. Boom, boom, boom. Before we knew it, we, had it, we closed April 15th of 2020 on our 808 LaZelle Street building. Right on, man. Right on. That was a good opportunity right there, huh? We were just say, hey, man, we're at the right place at the right time. I, 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 we've talked uh, about Danny Trejo. Like, I'm going to quote him if I may, but yeah. every good thing that's ever happened to me was a direct result of me helping somebody else. That's, that's true, too, man. That is so cool. So when you first started, you had how much frontage on uh, LaZelle Street? Oh, I think we had about, about 100 feet when we started. Um, what do you and have in now? 21, we bought the lot next to the gas station. It yeah. added like another 150 feet. Yeah. And then right at the end of 21 that year, we bought the building next to that lot. So right now, Rusty, we're probably sitting, it's like 350 feet in front of LaZelle Street. Prime property. Yeah, just like, like I said, just being at the right place at the right time. Right, it just, right, stars right, have been yeah. aligned since we moved here. It's the Black Hills has been very... Yeah. welcoming the community um everybody from the first responders the police everybody has been very very welcoming but like i'll i'll clean people's driveways out with my skid steer it's just growing up in south dakota that's just what we would do you just help your neighbor out and people hey what do i owe you like nothing because down the road they're going to be able to help you too yeah so you just, well, you just do the right feel, thing and everything how, works out how's it feel to have a shop right there in the middle of all that during the rally. It, I mean, it's got to be pretty cool, cool man. That, it's, huh? you know, uh, being on LaZelle Street, for people that don't know, that's the main artery that takes you into Sturgis and like out to the Buffalo Chip. And that's like, that's the main, that's the main thing happening, man. You know, yeah. it's like, that's the main artery that goes in and out. 
it, it's crazy, Rusty, because uh, by Memorial Day weekend, you start seeing bikes and it's exponential. They come up every day and it gets the thing is like there's a thunder during the rally. There's at the peak of rally, there's probably 50,000 bikes a day that go by our shop. Yeah. And from Memorial Day till like the last day of rally, it just keeps getting louder. And it's like you hear bikes from 6 a.m. till 2 in the morning for like three months. And they're a little fewer and farther between before rally. But like when rally time comes, there's a it's crazy because the whole town is lit up. All you hear is the sound of the rumble and Harley Davidson's. Yeah. And from about 2 in the morning to about 4.30 in the morning, you can't even hear a, a cat howl. It is, it just, it's like everything just shuts off. You get like two and a half hours where you don't hear anything. And then it starts up again. <laughs> That's cool, man. I know you were talking about uh, people setting up. I, I think a lot of people come out there around Memorial stay, they have business there, you know, setting up and, and, exp and it seems like a lot of these guys are always expanding. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's it's funny that you say that, Rusty, because uh, it seems the rally is getting longer. It used to be about a 12 day thing, but we got vendors and people that start setting up before the Fourth of July now, yeah. and it's just we we kind of call it the circus, but like it just it just starts up and it's it gets to a point where uh, it, the traffic's backed up. I mean, it, when like during the rally, we'll have uh, in the morning traffic will be backed up uh for three or four blocks it's it's just it's like it's like brake gas brake gas the bikes just lined up in front of our shop for hours usually up until about one in the afternoon and then you got that mid part of the day in the, during the rally that people go back to the campgrounds and kind of cool off and just chill after lunch and then it, it it's like uh it fires back up about six seven o'clock again and the bikes just start roaring in and then then when it starts getting darker out and the lights come on and more of the, more of the ambitious or uh, people that are maybe more, a little more, uh, I, I don't know, uh, maybe a little more aggressive, you'll see the bikes come sl just slamming down the road later on at night. But people get a little more, a little more edgier as the night goes on. It's, just, it's a neat experience. So where you're at, you're like Grand Central. So if somebody needs a battery, a tire, Park, yeah, we uh, you know they're you know, we got right you, we've huh? got a lot of friends that come out to rally where we're we're kind of like the last resort, the go to place. If somebody needs an oil change, somebody needs a certain size tire, somebody needs a certain battery, we can usually find anything within about an hour. Um, the thing that we do is we do a lot of the work that maybe some of the other places can't do um like we've got a welder like i've i don't know how many countless weld jobs i've done for guys we have we had guys with uh blown clutches we've had to do like in a split you know a few hours we've had we've had a lot of people that they you know they save their whole year to come out here and then uh the teeth gears on their um foot clutch on their trike are completely gnawed off and i got to replace the shaft on it and people that's usually the wife is like, you saved our vacation. Thank you so much. And that's a lot of the experiences that we've gotten from people at the rally here that they never forget. Like there's people that we've helped during the rally that they'll send us Christmas cards year after year. And we haven't seen them in years. And they're like, well, we're coming out for the 2024 or 25 or 26 rally or whatever. And those people, you create bonds with people that, that on a whim that you never even thought of when you wake up that morning. It's a, it's a really special thing. That's really cool, man. That is really cool. So what is the, uh, the meat and potatoes of your uh, business in the off season when the rallies? Well, well, I tell you, Rusty, we got, so we got the new building and uh, I like doing old cars and old trucks. Mm -hmm. That's kind of been, um, been a really good thing we've got a little bit of we've got a little bit of real estate that i, I play around with a little bit mm -hmm. um we do uh uh I, I play a little bit in the in the stock market um we, i'm a jack of all trades and a master of none i like working on but i like building old choppers at my pace in the winter time 
Um, you know, trying to find the right wishbone frame for a pan head, it could take a couple years when you got the right 54 engine waiting for the right transmission. A lot of these old bikes that I'd like to build, they, I don't slap them together in six months. I got to wait for the right stuff to show up for the right price. And yep. in the winter time, you can have dead spots in there. We've got uh, a lot of local people that I do maintenance on their bikes. Um, I, I've worked on everything from snow blowers to lawnmowers. And a lot of it's just like the local people, you know, and, and in return, when you help out all the people that live here year round during the rally, there's times when you think those people you helped out in the winter time would like, you could never help you out. That's when it shines. When you, when you're in a jam, those guys are like, Hey, remember me, you fixed my snowboard for free. We're going to come do this for your block party and bring uh 20 cases of soda and bring uh, 30 people here to help, help you grill steaks and stuff. I mean, it's just, it's reciprocal. It's awesome. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. All right, man. Um, can you uh, give us your address and your website information for people? To yeah. Contact so uh, our our website is sashacyclesofsturges.com. And then our, our address for the shop is 808 Lazelle Street. Okay. And do you have a, a shop phone or you just use your cell phone? Uh, I just use my cell phone. Okay. And I, 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 I prefer if you Google Sasha Cycles of Sturgis, Yep. My number is on there. Yep. Um, I prefer texts because I just sure. do my, my, I'm a quote, my friend, sugar bear, uh, due to the high volume of phone calls, uh, please leave me a text. Yeah. I, mean, I just, I just can't keep up with the phone. It's just, if I know a phone, if I'm getting a phone call, I, I can try to anticipate it or call right back. But usually if I don't know the phone number, I just don't answer it anymore. I just, so Yeah. Yeah, that's actually a really good way to do it. I, I like text better myself. That way you get to it when you can get to it and you know who it is because that, Absolutely. that irritates me too when I get a call and I don't know who it is because half the time it's, you know, some marketing thing, wasting your time, you know, and it's like you try or, to- hey, Rusty, I got a great idea, you know, or hey, Sasha, yeah, I got a great idea. That's like, a great right. idea for you, you know, but it's not a great idea for me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> All right. Well, look, it was great talking to you, man. And uh, I'll tell you what, I'm proud of what you're doing, man. It's it's, uh, it's a cool thing in a cool spot. Hey, Rusty, I, I appreciate everything that you've done. And uh, I, I that means a lot coming from you. And uh, I you. look forward to seeing you more in the future here. And let's have some fun, man. Oh, yeah. Well, you got it, man. All right. I'll talk to you later.